to hello. <laughs> we're, we're going to move on with a very interesting fireside chat. And we have together uh, two very, very interesting folks with me. Uh, previously, you might have seen, if you have tuned in, the keynote presentation of our advisor, Turing Award winner and Ethernet inventor, Professor Do Dr. Bob Metcalf, uh, who really up, up the atmosphere in the room with the with, uh, probably best joke this month on USB. <laughs> we have to create a knowledge asset out of that one, <laughs> definitely. Um, and to joining us as well is Ivan, uh, who you might know because if you watched YouTube, you probably run into him if you're trying to find something about blockchain. Actually, I did quite some time ago, I think 2016, 17 maybe. He had some really cool videos, like you could type in, uh, programmer explains Ethereum programmer explains Bitcoin. And it was such uh, well-explained, uh, simple language type of uh, videos that, uh, from what I understand, because of that, he got a, a tremendous amount of following. He's also a blockchain advocate, software developer, data scientist. Um, basically, his, his mission is to educate the community about blockchain crypto, has created the YouTube channel I mentioned called Ivan on Tech, and um, he's also literally a global phenomenon spreading knowledge on, on these technologies. Um, makes complex simple and delivers entertaining content. Also founder of the Morales platform. So welcome, Ivan. Hope you can hear us. Yes, yes, I can hear you, Brian Amir. Thanks a lot for the great uh, introduction. And uh, also good uh, seeing you. Uh, Professor Metcalf, and looking forward to this uh, fire chat. L let me know if we're ready to start or not. Uh, we are basically. So Ivan is going to be moderating a somewhat firesidey chat, but uh, it's, it's quite warm here, so you could say that it's kind of like somewhat over there. Um, so, pro but uh, with Professor and myself, I'm also going to be participating from here. So, um, yeah, Ivan, take it away. It's your it's your show. Awesome, awesome. Okay, big welcome everyone and uh, fantastic to be here. And also it's a, it's a privilege and a pleasure to be here with uh, the founders, you can say, of both uh, Web1, Web1.0, Professor Metcalf, and uh, Web3 and the knowledge graph revolution that we're seeing with Origin Trail. And there we have Brian Amir Rakesh or Brana or the, the Balkan tech powerhouse, as I call him as well. So first and foremost, uh, thanks a lot for the speech, uh, Professor Metcalf, and uh, thanks also for your life work. I mean, we're speaking here, it's online, it's uh, real time, a lot thanks to, uh, to, your, uh, to your work. And I'm in Sweden, you're in Texas, the guys here. You guys are in Ljubljana or where are you? In, uh, Ljubljana, in uh, yes. Belgrade. Ljubljana, Ljubljana. Uh, Ljubljana, yes. okay, yeah, that, that's, that, that's where we met as well. So yeah, in this fire chat, we will be discussing Web 1, uh, Web 3, and um, how Web 3 now is growing. So the first uh, question is to, you, is to you, Dr. Metcalf. Now that we are seeing the world becoming more and more connected, um, what role do you think that decentralization and the Web 3 can uh, play in, in this new world that is getting more online, more connected? Uh, how do we contribute to this growth with decentralization, with Web 3, do you think? Well, we're, we are uh, uh, upgrading the plumbing constantly. Uh, I, I think I started with web minus one and the, uh, the trunks of the internet ran at 50 kilobits per second. The fastest links in the internet were 50 kilobits per second. But now the new ethernet I hear is 800 gigabits per second. So the plumbing is, we're, we're going from the megabit internet to the gigabit internet uh, and plus we're getting uh, you know we're at 65 percent penetration of the pop more earth's population so that number is going up and up so now we can begin to take up serious excuse my dogs by the way uh, we're taking up serious applications that is those that require truth those that require reliability, namely the uh, knowledge graph. Um, the knowledge graph, I think, is the core of Web3. 
and and Branimir, uh, with uh, with this segue about the knowledge graph and uh, Web three uh, and how the killer app of uh, Web three will evolve. So we've seen glimpses of a potential killer app, and that's Bitcoin, which is worldwide recognized asset. You go to any country, they will know know what Bitcoin is. It is a global currency. You can probably buy and sell Bitcoin in all parts of the world. At least someone in any country will know the value of it and uh, buy it from you. And also we see ETH, Ethereum with DeFi uh, being quite a success as well with stable coins lending and so on and so forth. Very needed plumbing for this online financial uh, world where we can transact peer-to-peer uh, -peer without intermediaries and banks. Uh, so we already see the glimpses of this killer app, this alternative financial world where you have your own assets, it's self-custody, you can have a mobile phone and your money is in that phone without having to log in to some third party and beg them for permission to get access to your assets uh, and do KYC and all of that. So uh, how does uh, DKG play into that? And how do you think it, DKG will even accelerate this, uh, this killer app, uh, the advent of the killer app, which is the decentralized finance and, uh, and Web3 as a whole? You're, you're the expert. I thought Bitcoin had been irreparably damaged recently by the collapse of, uh, of um, uh, online money. Are you telling me that uh, Bitcoin is still prospering? Absolutely. Bitcoin <laughs> is, uh, if you look at any cryptocurrency, Bitcoin is the go-to cryptocurrency that, is, that has broad recognition that uh, people in any country will, will accept. But uh, over to you, Branimir, what do you think about this whole concept of Bitcoin? Or do, do you not believe in it? We're happy to have a debate as well. Happy to hear what both of you think, uh, Professor Metkov and Branimir. Oh, for sure. I think it's a great topic. Um, I, so, so Bitcoin brought... Basically, uh, I think Jack Dorsey said that Bitcoin white paper is basically a, like sort of the almost one of the best ever technically written papers. He compares it to, if possible, like this would be something closest to the world of poetry in the world of, of tech. And because it's very simple and it, it explains the value propositions even to somebody who might not be that, um, that knowledgeable about the technology. And in a way, Bitcoin is a couple of connected technologies together. So again, we have this notion of connectivity, right? So it connected hashing, it connected the, a new form of consensus called Nakamoto consensus, and it brought something very cool for the first time. We could have a decentralized system without basically any centralized control, permissionless, which you could use to transact or store value. Um, but it was very limited. So that uh, the comment by Professor Metcalf is totally um, appropriate and expected because a lot of people hear a lot of stuff about Bitcoin, uh, especially in different times, depending on, on the climate or the, you know, what type of uh, sentiment is around. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that the technology hasn't been hacked ever since it's been created, 2008. Uh, so that's a lot of years. And it's been going around, but with some limitations. Some Somebody would say very serious limitations, very low throughput. So for example, the original idea gets criticized from that exact white paper. The original, basically, first sentence, if I'm not mistaken, says that it's electronic cash. And when you think of cash, you think of something that you go and pay coffee with, right? Well, the problem with Bitcoin is it cannot support the entire world paying coffees all the time because it doesn't have throughput for, for that many uh, transactions. And big reason for that is actually the reason that by design. So the design itself is that um, constraints throughput in order to achieve security and that's a big reason why it hasn't been hacked for, for so long. Ethereum brings the next layer of innovation where it like expands that limit, limit, those limits to some very, very basic things that like such as tra sending transactions and uh, you know, sort of not being able to, to do proper programming. Ethereum introduces the idea of having verifiable code. So anybody can create something called a smart contract, which doesn't necessarily only have to be sending uh, money around or paying for coffee. Rather, it can do some very interesting autonomous activities. And one of those Ivan mentioned was DeFi. So all of a sudden, we had this world of finance be, in a way, recreated with all of its benefits and flaws in the decentralized space. Um, but I would argue that both of these technologies are fundamentally 
like I said, limited due to security, and this limitation has been shown for the past 15 years, uh, having sort of a narrow scope of capability or proven use cases for the technology, exactly because it doesn't allow for connectivity on the data level. So both, both blockchains mentioned, but any other blockchain, uh, even though sometimes marketed as databases, are not really databases. They are very limited ledgers, and that means for any developer ever who tried to query something from a blockchain, you probably had a hard time. If you wanted to write some more complex question type of query like we've seen today, that doesn't work, it's not possible. So I would argue that the third wave, this um, next level of um, unlocking potential comes with the DKG. And if I would have to say something along the lines of a killer app, well, the killer app would definitely be something that uses a lot of knowledge or a lot of data. And I'm pretty sure that uh, everybody knows that AI is the, the, the one thing that is super hungry for, for data. And um, I remember, and I, I'd like to actually point to Professor Metcalf, remember saying how you throughout your ca career have seen AI sort of go up and sort of stop, and go up and stop. And I remember you made the argument that it would run out of data. So can you reflect a little bit on that and tell us how you saw the, the progress of AI over the course of, uh, of, of your career? Well, AI repeatedly, repeatedly has run out of data historically, but my, my theory now is that it's not gonna run out of data this time. That is, uh, AI and uh, blockchain and uh, and the bandwidth of the net uh, are going to provide the day are providing the data that AI needs to flourish. So AI on top of on top of the uh, uh, of the um, uh, all the blockchains. By the way, you support multiple blockchains. Uh, what, yes. what was behind that? Did you do that? Yes, actually, that's a very good point. So. Um, by design, Origin 12 DKG, ever since the first decentralized version of Origin 12 was basically sketched out in 2017, um, was something we call blockchain agnostic or multi-chain, uh, having basically um, allowing the ability to anyone who wants to use the technology to pick a chain of their choice. And over time, we've been um, integrating the DKG with multiple different blockchains, starting from Ethereum, then moving to, Poly uh, to Gnosis blockchain at the time called XDAI, uh, Polygon, and then Polkadot since last year on a custom-built blockchain for Origin 12 called Origin 12 Parachain. And the idea is not to stop there, so the idea is to continue and to basically enable any community that wants to use the DKG to empower their ecosystem or their tools to integrate with the DKG. And um, there's actually a very precise process on how that can be done. So whoever is watching this perhaps and interested, I would like to invite you to look at the RFC repository, Requests for Comments of the Origin Trail community, uh, which is discussing all of these matters in, in open and uh, basically uh, designing these ideas in open. Uh, w w speaking about the protocols, and uh, thanks for your comments, guys, on the, on the previous topic. Speaking about the protocol designs and, and how we develop the Web3 protocols, uh, I would like to ask uh, you, Dr. Metkoff, uh, looking at your past experience developing the internet and really creating the, fo the foundation of the modern internet, uh, what kind of lessons have you learned and what would you do maybe a bit differently? if you had to design from scratch and what lessons can we learn in Web3 as protocol developers? Because all Web3 at the end of the day is protocols. It's protocols on top of the existing internet that facilitate value transactions and uh, decentralization. So do you have any advice for us and some lessons learned from protocol design designs of the internet? So let me ask, how's the standardization going? Is there convergence? Uh, well, both, I would say both yes and no. In some ways, definitely. Uh, looking, for example, at standards on top of Ethereum, how to do a coin, how to do an NFT, and the fact that uh, a lot of new chains are using exactly the same technologies. They fork uh, Ethereum. But in other ways, we also have uh, a lot of differences with new layer ones. I'll leave to Brandimir to expand on that as well. Uh, do you think we have good standardization or, or we're early, Brandimir? Uh, it's, yeah, it's kind of depends on the way you look at it. So I would say, 
I would agree with you. It's kind of both yes and no. And the reason is because we're just so early. There's so many new things, and uh, they haven't been tested out in the wild as much yet. So um, um, in the sense of having, for example, a lot of enterprise deployments or applications built in Web3, um, not, not to sound arrogant, or, or, but there's not that many other in the real world in the enterprise other than origin trail implementations that I can point out um, that, that are doing real stuff with real value. And um, I just think it's early, but we've seen some great presentations at the beginning of the day, uh, especially from Phil and Dominic uh, talking about standards uh, such as verifiable credentials, which basically enable verifiable sharing, not just of credentials, though I would like that they kept the old name. The old name was verifiable claims, so we can sort of think of it as a bit broader. It, essentially, somebody makes a claim, and you can verify what was the claim and that indeed that person or organization made it. So there's there's very interesting movement there, but however, we could hear from Phil that even GS1 is still figuring out what to do with this W3C standard, by the way. Uh, another standard is decentralized identifiers get, being picked up quite a bit and used in the in the DKG by, it, by itself. Um, and the standards you mentioned from, from the Ethereum space, and those are very interesting because they come out very quickly and get iterated on very quickly. So I, I think we're moving in a good direction. It's just um, it's, it's a question of what comes first. And I think right now, more building and more work and more testing in the real world comes first before we can figure out how to standardize it properly. And some things we did, W3C did verifiable credentials, identifiers, URIs, um, that those those things we kind of know, but but what where, where it goes with NFTs and track first but, like but, stories. But Vladimir, those uh, so sorry, Vladimir, but those, those standards you mentioned mm -hmm. are they Web three or they're just because like GS one, it's it's in a general enterprise uh, standard for uh, products. Actually, right? this this uh, is or do you, do you count them as Web three as well? So this is W three C and standards that are specifically tackling decentralized technologies. So I cannot really separate them from Web3 um, in that sense. But going back to Ike's question, sense. we learned in Web012 that standards are very important and they're hard to win, but you're already, uh, uh, Trace is already adopting a good strategy, which is bringing customers. You bring customers into the, into the standards discussion and that accelerates uh, adoption, and I think I think you're doing a good job of that. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, Brian, uh, both of you guys, uh, Professor Metkov and Brian, you mentioned the advent of AI and that uh, uh, Web three could potentially be a catalyst to that. Uh, so my first, I have two questions, one to Brynimir, another to Dr. Metcalf. So, so Brynimir, first and foremost, can you elaborate a bit on that? Why is Web3 needed for AI? No, that's a great question. I'm going to try to be quick. Um, so essentially, throughout the day, we've been talking about problems such as verification, truth, uh, identity, and all of these things become extremely, they're, they're extremely important in the web itself, but Today, with the advent of AI and all of the content being produced, just some of the things we can think about that immediately illustrate uh, where the world is heading is um, the amount of content on, on the web has been growing exponentially ever since the web was created. But now that content, that, that, that speed goes even further with AI. And very soon we're going to have con more content online created by AI than humans ever. Um, and we had quite, quite a bit of time to create content, centuries, in fact. Um, so um, when that threshold is crossed, it's going to be very interesting to see what kind of content is true. Why, how do we know that it's true? And uh, the plumbing for that, for those protocols that are going to help us determine the truth or verify certain claims, uh, have to come from Web3. I actually think... Um, we mentioned today, Tim Berners-Lee many times, this notion of semantic web. I think one reason why people uh, would say that semantic web didn't succeed, and I would argue that it did, but in a different, se seg uh, in a different sector, is because we didn't have things like Bitcoin and decentralization. Um, if you look at the stack that Tim Berners-Lee drew, he has a very nice stack of everything from URIs and RDF and ontologies, and at the top, there's like cherry on top, the smallest piece is trust. What I think uh, 
over the years we learned that trust has to be at the bottom of the stack. It has to be the first thing you build on top of. Um, and because they didn't have that at the time, they couldn't obviously introduce it. So what happened is Semantic Web got captured by Web2. So big companies such as our friends from Google, for example, <laughs> they built their internal Semantic Webs, knowledge graphs, and they closed them in. So they made silos of very valuable information and ex basically, I would argue that all the biggest Web2 companies are the biggest due to the fact largely because they knew how to extract value from their data and for that they needed to use knowledge graphs. So to, to wrap this thought up, um, AI is going to need this integrity and this trust layer at the bottom of it and that's where both blockchains and the DKG bring this capability or as we call it, this trusted knowledge foundation. Um, without it, I actually think Web3 is now finding its real real purpose and trust outside of finance, we're going to have to be, we're going to be able to implement it pretty much anywhere now. Another, another lesson that Sir Tim taught us that we should note is he, he introduced the web as three new standards, HTML, HTTP, and the URL. And the, the experts in each of those fields commented that those standards were lame. And as Tim <laughs> proposed three lame standards, but then they were adopted and the web took off. So there's the lesson. Uh, one way to lose is to spend too much time perfecting the standard rather than uh, grabbing one that's adequate and running with it now. And that's exactly the mentality we have with Origin Drill. So we build and then we iterate. Uh, so it's, uh, it's so great to hear that from, from you, Professor, and uh, to, to validate that approach. Thanks so much. So how many assets do you have in the distributed knowledge graph now? Nearly 1.5 million since the, the latest version was launched. Anybody know the right number? Yep, Almost 1.5 right now, yes. Is that a big number or a big number? I can't tell. Well, <laughs> depends on the historical moment. I would say since we launched very recently, it's kind of big, yeah. but our ambition is to go to 100 billion relatively soon. So compared to that, it's quite small. And, and, and you, Dr. Metcalf, you're know, known for the Metcalf's law, which uh, reflects that the, the value of the network is based on, on the users of the network. The more users, the, the more value, and it grows exponentially. Uh, how do you think this changes with AI and that we will have a lot of machine AI agents in the near future? Uh, does the law apply exactly the same? Or do you think there's any kind of difference to, to Metcalf's law now that uh, we'll have more and more intelligent agents which are artificial? Well, the uh, <laughs> Metcalf's law has never been exactly true of anything. But uh, I think the thing that Metcalf's law sort of finesses is it doesn't explain what the value is. It says the value grows as the square or the number of users without filling in the detail. AI is a value enhancer. So you put an AI in one of the participants in a network, its, it's, uh, uh, it's value will um, be leveraged by Metcalf's law and not determined by Metcalf's law. So I would expect AI driven networks to be much more valuable than pre uh, AI driven networks, I would expect. In fact, we should look at that and see if there's any numerical basis of it. It's beginning to be, it's beginning to, it's beginning to, uh, there's enough of it around, we could begin to measure it. And, and Brian Emir, looking at the, your lessons that you've learned from uh, Dr. Matkoff, uh, what have you learned? What are the key lessons that you've learned and that you will keep in mind when building on the DKG? in the future? A great question. I may, I may look for a commission. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I learned uh, that uh, the USB problem propagates uh, <laughs> to not just USB slots. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, we, we really, really appreciate uh, all of the, the learnings, uh, and there's a ton of them that we got from Professor uh, throughout his advisory. 
You understand that the USB joke is perishable. You know, the new USBs don't have this problem. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So I have to tell a lot now while it's still a little bit funny. <laughs> there you go. Another, another learning just there. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it, was, it was super funny. The whole room was, <laughs> was laughing. Um, but anyway, the, 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 the learnings, I mean, I can mention a few, but uh, it's always been a, a, a very... Um, not just exciting but inspiring talk with Professor Bob because not only would he be interested in concepts like NFTs, uh, which from what I know he owns some land in some metaverse, <laughs> but also, which is cool and, and it, was, it was inspiring to, to talk about these topics, uh, but even more so, and I'll go back to the topic of connectivity, uh, because he always um, tried to, uh, and still does, try to uh, direct us in the, uh, in the in the direction of how can we build uh, the technology not as one per one basis, so for Swiss Railway or for Walmart or for somebody, but rather how can, the questions he would ask would be like, would Swiss Railway like another railway to use this? Would Walmart like Home Depot to use this? And this gets you thinking about in some sort of counterintuitive way. You're used, especially as an engineer, I'm used to like, you know, there's some requirements, there's some code we need to write, we need to test it, and then we need to like, you know, solve some problem for one customer, but no customer is going to tell you, um, hey, it would be cool if you build something that I want to use with maybe even my competitor. And that's where connectivity actually has the biggest potential, and it's one of the, the learnings that I remembered, because this triggered a lot of the thinking for uh, Origin 12 v6. Um, so, uh, not, not sure how well I could explain that, but uh, such questions are so inspiring and give us uh, su such new room to explore um, that have literally been driving a lot of the developments over the past couple of years. So I've used the opportunity to thank again Professor Mehab for all of this and looking forward to having more of those chats and chats like this. Well, we just need to get go viral. And you don't go viral by uh, doing uh, one-offs. Uh, for example, by giving people money to, to try your product. That's not, that's may or may not be good, but it's not viral. It's viral if each of your customers wants all your other customers to be customers. If you can get a, uh, that's how you get to be viral. So I'm constantly looking for that. Is there anything in what, right now that, that promises to go viral? It's a very good question. I would, I would say many things because the, the way we harnessed with this new version of the technology, uh, the ability to connect is, is unprecedented. We haven't had this capability before with Origin Trail. So today, somebody like Amos can create his platform and then somebody like Barbara can introduce her uh, art in the platform. And let's say somebody like Stevan who makes music or Nikita who is another uh, of our uh, teammates make music can introduce that into the platform without Amos needing to do anything, which is uh, exactly this capability of virality that was there for social networks for essentially opening up the, the floor, but in a much better way than, than social networks. So to be honest, uh, I'm, I cannot be more excited than to see how we grow these, and I think these, will, these new pockets of value will quickly grow in, as mushrooms into enormous uh, colonies of new communities and, and products. Um, so I'm super excited for that. Let's go viral. Let's, let's go viral. <laughs> mushrooms. And let's standardize and build great protocols. Thanks a lot, to Brandimir. Thanks a lot, Dr. Metkoff. It was a pleasure to speak with you today and uh, looking forward to updates and the development of the Origin Trail protocol as well. And thanks everyone for watching. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Professor.